from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The lingering effects of high heat. It can hold on to those eggs for uh, several weeks. See what researchers are keeping an eye on in Louisiana. A Minnesota dairy in the hot seat accused of millions of dollars in wage theft and providing substandard living conditions as the heartland digs out from a major snowstorm, the impacts on people and livestock. So you're going to see a big drop in, in, in performance and, and, and in the weight of the cattle, in my opinion. The latest right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Happening right now, a dangerous winter storm is continuing to push its way across the country. And it's bringing snow with it. Everything from snow to strong winds, heavy rain, even the potential for more tornadoes. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins me. And Michelle, this powerful storm is causing concerns at feedlots and packing plants. Clinton, this is the first major winter storm to hit cattle country this season, and there are several more systems in the extended forecast. Now, this is impacting both cattle producers and beef processors. And while the market kind of faded the news on Monday, it may need to add more weather premium. This massive winter storm dumped more snow than forecast with 20 plus inches in the heaviest areas. The bullseye was in Nebraska and Kansas and it impacted beef processors with USDA reporting only 115,000 head of cattle slaughtered Monday and 94,000 on Tuesday. Employees were stranded overnight at Tyson Fresh Meats in Holcomb, Kansas due to the weather and the A shift for processing and harvest was canceled on Tuesday morning. First, I don't have exactly a whole list of them. They're a little private about that information, but I know that we lost the B shift or the second shift at a couple of places where you would expect, right? Uh, Nebraska uh, yesterday, uh, where the, the kind of the epicenter, where the worst of that weather was, kind of was between Grand Island and Omaha Sioux City. And there's plant closing stories today, too, all the way down into Kansas, where they might miss a shift or something like that. The weather also hurts average daily gains with the extreme cold and muddy feedlot conditions. This will reverse the trend of record cattle carcass weights the last several weeks tied to the dry and mild fall and early winter weather. So now these cattle go from, go from growing four pounds a day to all of a sudden, wham, stand still, lose weight. Now you're going to feed them for two or three weeks to try to get their weight back to where it was before that. So you're going to see a big drop in, in, in performance and, and, and in the weight of the cattle, in my opinion. Comprehensive beef carcass weights had tapered off the last three weeks from record highs. Quema says weights will drop faster with this winter weather and another major storm forecast to hit the southwest next week. That should be supportive for cattle prices longer term. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Besides the impact on livestock and processors, just traveling around right now in the wake of the storm is a chore. Let's continue a look in Kansas, where blizzard conditions on roadways reduced visibility almost down to zero. The state on Tuesday was under a state of disaster emergency declaration. In Nebraska, heavy snow closed sections of Interstate 80 and 30. People were warned to stay off the roads. It was much the same story in New Mexico, where 50 drivers were stranded in blizzard conditions on Highway 56 in northeastern Union County. Now, the sheriff's office says they had to be done dug out, while in the south, a trail of damage after multiple tornadoes moved across the Florida Panhandle. The National Weather Service reported a large and extremely dangerous tornado near Panama City. Another tornado reportedly hit near the city of Mariana. That's about an hour north of Panama City Beach. According to the Storm Prediction Center, at least five tornadoes were reported Tuesday morning. While conditions will be quieter for a little while, bitter cold conditions and another storm system are on the way. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has a look ahead. Snowfall potential continues to rise in and across the United States. The first system moving out, a second one is going to start moving in. Again, this is Wednesday morning and also into our Wednesday afternoon with the potential not only for some light snow into Minnesota and Wisconsin, uh, but then heavier snow back into the plains going into our Friday morning. From there, this is going to scoop back up to the north, laying down a uh, decent amount of snowfall in and across the Midwest.
And here's another look at all that snow. Farm Journal's uh, Tyne Morgan capturing these scenes in Missouri. She reported about seven inches of snow on the ground at the time and said it was still coming down and the winds were picking up. Not to mention, uh, but the power was also out. Hopefully people are finding ways to stay warm. I'll have more on your active forecast coming up. In less than a week, the first votes will be cast ahead of the 2024 presidential election with the Iowa caucuses happening on Monday. Republican candidates Donald Trump, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis and Vivek Ramaswamy are crisscrossing Iowa ahead of the vote. The GOP candidates are pouring millions of dollars into the first voting state, flooding the airwaves in an attempt to challenge former President Trump's considerable lead in the polls. Now, AgriTalk recently inviting all the presidential candidates to take part in a question and answer session with host Chip Flory. Last month, they spoke with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Yesterday, Chip spoke with the former governor of South Carolina, Nikki Haley. He asked, what is the top ag issue she would address as president? And the first thing is get the EPA out of the way. Right now they care more about sagebrush lizards than they do about whether we can afford our utility bill. And then start seeing, you know, producers as the partners that they are. You know, I mean, food security is national security. That's always been the case. And we can't ever be okay with getting our food from overseas. We have to make sure not only do we have enough food produced here in America, but that we have more than enough that we can export overseas so that we can make it the powerhouse that we know it can be. That's the same with energy. You know, you've got biofuels here in yeah. Iowa. It's hugely important that we see that for the opportunity that it is. Now, according to a new CNN poll, Haley's campaign is picking up steam in New Hampshire, where she has 32% of support from likely primary voters who were polled. She's still behind former President Trump, who holds 39%. One item that's become a hot topic on Capitol Hill, foreign land ownership. And a new report says a Chinese national is one of the largest non-American holders of land in the U.S. Chinese online gaming tycoon Tian Xiao Chen is now one of the most prominent non-American landowners in the U.S. The land report says Chen owns 198,000 acres of timberland in Oregon. It makes him the country's 82nd largest property owner, according to that land report. And it says the country's biggest landowner is the Emerson family, which owns the Timberland Empire Sierra Pacific Industries. That's followed by billionaires John Malone, Ted Turner, and Stan Kroenke. The Minnesota Attorney General is accusing a dairy in the state of wage theft. Attorney General Keith Ellison accusing Evergreen Acres Dairy of at least three million in wage theft and also of providing substandard housing to Evergreen employees. The Attorney General's office supplying these pictures. The office claims some workers live in windowless bedrooms with plywood walls, unfinished electrical sockets, and only space heaters for warmth. The complaint filed against the dairy says many employed are unauthorized workers, largely from a region of Mexico that doesn't speak Spanish. It claims Evergreen Acres has used the vulnerabilities of the unauthorized workforce to withhold large sums of earned wages from its employees. It also claims that Evergreen Acres didn't keep employment records required by law, destroyed time cards, and falsified records. Now, Evergreen Acres runs 18 facilities across central Minnesota. So far, there hasn't been a statement released from the owners of Evergreen Acres. The size of the theft makes this one of the largest enforcement actions our office has taken to fight wage theft. Evergreen isn't just some small family farm. It's a large operation that over the last three years has employed hundreds of workers who work at multiple locations in Stearns and Redwood counties. Many of its workers find their roots in Mexico, and they, some of them don't speak very much English at all. Nebraska state regulators say JBS is responsible for sending a so-called sludge blanket into two rivers. The Nebraska Department of Environment and Energy saying an anaerobic wastewater lagoon was breached over the weekend in Grand Island. It estimates 4 million gallons of wastewater discharged from the lagoon and went into a ditch that leads into the Wood River. It then traveled into the Platte River about 15 miles from the JBS plant. It's reported JBS contracted a cleanup company to vacuum up the spill. JBS says it took immediate action to reduce any impacts and is working with state and federal officials to handle the cleanup. Now it says the release has been stopped and the plant is back to operating normally. Interesting research out of China with scientists reporting 
they have found a way to convert coal into protein, which could be used in livestock feed. The discovery coming from biotech researchers at the Chinese Academy of Science. First, they transform the coal into methanol using gasification. The methanol is then fed a special strain of yeast, which ferments to produce a single cell protein that comes complete with amino acids, vitamins, inorganic salts, and carbohydrates. They say the result is much richer in protein than plants and can be used to partially replace things such as soybeans and meat in animal feed. The South China Morning Post says researchers have already teamed up with a manufacturing partner to start industrial demonstrations. Most of the ag market had a better day on Tuesday. We'll find out why coming up. And later, summer mosquitoes are a pain, literally. Today, a look at why a different kind of mosquito set up shop in Louisiana this past year in the country. Grain markets recovered on Tuesday after a rough start to the week. Michelle has analysis in markets now. Grains mostly higher on Tuesday. Brian Grady with Pro Farmer joining us. And Brian, the recovery that we saw off an ugly day on Monday, was that mostly corrective buying? Yeah, just purely corrective. I think, uh, you know, the, the downside's been sharply overdone. We finished uh, 2023 with the funds uh, being active sellers. We started 2024 uh, with that same pattern. And, uh, you know, the downside's overdone. The funds are heavily weighted to the short side of most of these markets. And we have USDA's barrage reports coming up on Friday. And, and so uh, everything said that basically we need to take a pause and, and correct. So when we sell off this hard going into a WASD report, how bearish does it have to be really to confirm the trend continuing to be lower? Yeah, I, I think that the data Friday, and, and there's a lot, uh, but the data Friday overall has to be um, uh, bearish or, or heavily bearish to, to get a, a negative response, um, a sharp negative response. The more likely scenario is that you get some sort of a bullish surprise and, and uh, it helps them at short-term lows. Now, with that said, uh, it's, it's probably got to be uh, pretty heavily bullish uh for us to shoot higher in these markets uh, and get the funds to actively cover short positions. Absolutely. So early estimates don't see much change in terms of the domestic balance sheets, but what about quarterly stocks? Could that be the big surprise? That's the number that the, the market uh, kind of fears, so to speak, uh, because there have been so many surprises, especially on the corn side. Uh, it's just a, a number that we've uh, missed uh, as a whole, uh, as analysts by multiple hundreds of millions of bushels. Uh, and so that typically does provide a, a surprise. Um, you know, the crop as final crop estimates for corn and soybeans, probably not likely to move a whole lot. Ending stocks, like you mentioned, probably not likely to move a whole lot. Uh, global production, uh, the South American production numbers, uh, in particular Brazil, uh, those are, are too high from where USDA was in December, but they're not likely to get down as low as the, the private estimates. And, and so uh, in all likelihood, it will be the grain stocks that uh, provide a movement either up or down uh, after Friday's report data. Right, thanks for that. Brian Grady with Pro Farmer. We'll have more on date coming up. So I thought we'd start off by taking a look at uh, the two major systems working across the United States. One moving out and the other one that is going to start to move in. Let's go through our Wednesday and into our Thursday. You're going to have some ridging, but also a weak clipper system that could put down about an inch of snowfall, uh, possibly Thursday and a little bit into Friday morning. Otherwise, uh, a bigger system starts to take shape. Now, this is Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, notice that the uh, dividing line between the rain and the snow once again is going to play havoc for snowfall totals and rainfall in and across the Midwest, specifically in Illinois, Indiana and Michigan. This is Friday at 9 a.m. As we push uh, this system up to the north and out, it's going to be laying down a good uh, about eight inches or so with uh, obviously some higher snowfall totals uh, where it is all snow in and across the United States. After that, it's all about the cold air. So this is Saturday at 9 p.m. Sunday and into Monday, much colder air starts to dive in from the north to the south. And you'll see that on the jet stream on Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, there's that system you know, working in from the north and off to the northeast. But the purple is what's going to be sinking in Monday and into Tuesday and continuing 
to hang around. This is a typical wintertime pattern. If you're talking about an Arctic blast, well below average temperatures, uh, that is what the jet stream is currently showing Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, a time period. A uh, significant ridging though, back out here towards the west while we're in the freezer in and across the Midwest and also back up into Canada, but also stretching as far south as parts of Texas. So here's a look at that temperature outlook. This is the 14th through the 18th, a pocket of very cold air in and across the United States, a little bit warmer with the ridging back on the West Coast. Uh, but again, uh, this is kind of the uh, exact opposite of what we had in December. Uh, the trend is to keep the cold air around through the second part of January before things start to moderate. There's a look at the precipitation outlook. At uh, this time of year, you get that cold and it's tough to hold on to any moisture. That's why we're seeing uh, normal, if not drier than normal conditions. Only New York, snow showers high around 37 degrees, low of 28. Louisiana, partly cloudy, high of 57, low of 41. And because I want to warm you up with some tropical feels, Hilo, Hawaii. Good news for U.S. meat exports into Mexico. We'll have details next. And later, a new type of mosquito has some Louisiana producers on edge. We'll tell you about it today in the country. The government of Mexico recently issuing a decree extending zero duty treatment of certain food imports. That includes pork, beef, and poultry. Aaron Bohr of the U.S. Meat Export Federation explains how the duty-free policy of Mexico has impacted competition in the largest destination for U.S. pork. The U.S. and Canada are at zero duty through NAFTA and USMCA. So the zero tariff benefits were really going on the pork side to Europe. And then with Brazil beginning shipments in February of 2023, Brazil was also benefiting. Those exports from Brazil had ticked up above 5,000 metric tons a month. But then in late November, a Mexican court actually halted the access for Brazil related to their sanitary access. So the court case has resulted in at least a temporary suspension of Brazilian pork entering Mexico. 90% of our exports are chilled and difficult for Brazil to compete head on. So our share of total exports of pork to Mexico actually increased from the prior two years to 84%. So that Brazilian product that is made in Rhodes, they were taking market share from Canada and Brazil took share from Europe. The zero duty on beef, pork and poultry will last through the end of this year. The direct to consumer meat industry is making strides. That's according to Chop Local's recent survey involving over 300 meat businesses across 46 states. It reports an increase in direct to consumer producers selling going from 65% in 2022 to 75% last year. In 2023, 55% of producers operated an online store, up slightly from 53% in 2022, and there was a surge in producers shipping meat directly to consumers, increasing from 9% in 2022 to 25% last year. Now, the survey says the shifts correlate with higher meat sales. For more on those results and the survey, check out porkbusiness.com. It was an odd weather year for Louisiana agriculture. It also meant increasing numbers of a certain type of mosquito that's not as common to that region. We'll have details next. While we're talking snow and cold these days, Louisiana is still battling back from last year's extreme heat. Among other issues, the weather gave rise to a mosquito species that is not normally seen in such big numbers. LSU Ag Center reporter Craig Gotro has a story. The extreme heat and drought conditions experienced this year have caused many problems across Louisiana, but the weather was a boon to a mosquito species that flourishes under these harsh conditions. It's not a new mosquito. Um, it's one that became uh, more of an issue this year because of some of the interesting climatic changes that we had this year, uh, particularly drought and very high temperatures. The scientific name is Culex nigropalpus, but the common name is Florida SLE mosquito, with the SLE standing for St. Louis encephalitis. It's also a competent vector for West Nile virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, Eastern equine encephalitis virus, all potential viruses that we have in the state of Louisiana. Mosquitoes will typically lay their eggs shortly after taking a blood meal, but this species can wait until conditions are more favorable. It can hold on to those eggs for uh, several weeks, three, four weeks at a time, just kind of waiting for 
flooding conditions to occur. The good news is the arrival of winter will reduce interactions with mosquitoes. We're in those that time of the year now where we probably won't really see a resurgence of those mosquitoes again because of all of the extreme cold that we are we are having now. So so that's a positive. Healy said the hot, dry weather this year did reduce overall number of mosquitoes. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. All right, thanks, Craig. And that's all the time we have this morning. We should let you tune in from all of us here at Ag Day. I'm Clinton Davis. Have a great day.